Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Applications of IR Biotyper, Biosurveillance of Candida Aris and Two Tales of Salmonella SPP. I am Megan Pascal of LabRoots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is presented by LabRoots and brought to you by Bruker Daltonics. To learn more, visit Bruker.com. We encourage you to participate today by submitting any questions you may have during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click Send. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. You may also submit any technical issues here as well if you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation. I'd like to now welcome our speaker, Dr. Daisy Contreras, Clinical Associate at Cedars sinai Medical Center in Los Angeles, California. Dr. Contreras, you may now begin your presentation. Thank you for that introduction and thank you for the opportunity to host this webinar and share the different applications that we have been exploring within our clinical microbiology laboratory here at Cedar sinai uh, with a focus on our Canada Aura's two-tier diagnostic algorithm surveillance program and how the IR biotyper helps us uh, in our salmonella investigation case that I will share with you later on in the second part of, of the talk. I hope after sharing some preliminary data and some of the application routes that we took with this uh, new technology, that it opens up the horizon for other laboratories to begin and explore the different applications as we continue to do here in the laboratory. This is a brief outline of what I'm going to be focusing on throughout my talk. Um, two main applications that I will be discussing today is how the IR biotyper was used for fungal strain typing as part of our second tier um, in our two-tier diagnostic algorithm for our Canada RS surveillance program here at Cedar sinai with a special focus on first asking the initial questions of does it even have the discriminatory power to distinguish between clinically significant fungal pathogens. The second application is how the IR biotyper aided in our salmonella case that was recovered in two distinct separate stem cell culture um, and its role in salmonella strain typing. I have no disclosures, I have nothing to disclose. Before I begin my talk, let me briefly introduce our hospital. I'm sure most of you are familiar with, I work at Cedar sinai Medical Center known to most of you as the Hospital to the Stars in beautiful Beverly Hills. We are a 980 bed facility. It is one of the major surrounding hospitals and multi-specialty academic health science centers in the Los Angeles area. Our microbiology laboratory serves the main medical center as well as our affiliate Marino Del Rey Hospital, which is a 200 bed community surgical hospital along with our countless outreach and outpatient clinics. The microbiology laboratory is a 24-7, seven days a week, 365 days a year service laboratory. We roughly have a little bit over five, 55 full-time employees that include both clinical laboratory scientists as well as MLAs. We handle around a little bit over 6,000 specimens per week in all of the subspecialties, including virology, molecular microbiology, bacteriology, both aerobic, anaerobic. We have a full service BSL-3 mycobacteriology laboratory where we handle all of our all of our MTB work as well as some of the emerging pathogens work that we've been seeing lately, which is great for us. Um, we have a full service mycology laboratory where you know this is where we actually encounter these nasty bugs such as Canada Aris. What is Canada Aris, you might ask? I'm sure everyone here listening in this webinar is very familiar with this nasty organism. Canada Aris is a multi drug resistant fungal pathogen uh, with some strains resistant to all three classes of antifungals, including your azoles, your echinocandins, and your polyenes. It was first reported in 2009 following the isolation from an ear canal, hence the name Aris, of a patient in Japan. Retrospective studies of three unidentified yeast cases in South Korea in 1996 identified one of the cases as Candida Aris, making it the earliest known case on record. So as you can see, 
it dates back as far back as 1996. The superbug has been primarily associated with invasive and nosocomial infections such as candidemia, but has been reported to cause central nervous system, respiratory, urogenital, skin and soft tissue, as well as bone infections. As you can see, it holds and represents a wide spectrum of disease. On the other spectrum of infection is colonization, especially in patients in long-term acute care hospitals and skilled nursing facilities. Primary sites of colonization include the axilla groin, but has been found to be colonized in the nares and rectum as well. Literature shows that Canada RS can be isolated for up to three months after initial infection, even if the infection has cleared, therefore allowing it to easily spread among the most vulnerable of our patient population. Here I have a picture of a global map taken from an article from Current Opinion in Microbiology published in 2019. And I think this figure, this illustration really highlights the global spread of this uh, superbug. Beginning in 2009, where you only really saw Canada RS infections concentrated in Japan and South Korea, which those were the first reported cases. And then over time, as people traveled, and as you know, the world is connected and we are all joined as one. And eventually it came across and travel across the continents by 2015, which was the first reported case in the U.S., all the way to 2018, where you really can see the distinct spread distinct spread of Canada RS globally. Phylogenetic studies of these isolates have identified five predominant strain populations belonging to different clades, having all geographical ties to their first uh, report. You have your clad one, which is referred to your South Asian lineage, your clad two, which is your East Asian lineage, your clad three, which is your African lineage, and then your clad four, your South American lineage. And recently in 2019, there was a fifth clad of Canada Rs that was identified um, in Iran from an ear canal of a girl, which shows to be distinct from the other four lineages. So now that you know the designation of the different clads of Canada RS and how they were all designated from the uh, geographical location of origin, let's take a closer look at what is going on here specifically related to the U.S. So there was a study conducted by Chow et al. that was published in 2018 that showed that Canada RS um, of all four different clads, which includes your South American clad, your East Asian clad, your African clad, as well as your South Asian clad, um, have all been reported throughout the U.S. The interesting part is that most of these cases have been associated with outbreaks in long-term care, acute care hospitals, and skilled nursing facilities, specifically in your metropolitan areas of New York, Chicago, California, etc. In California, it seems that the majority of Canada RS isolates are from the South Asian lineage, but a recent study um, that was published in 2020 um, actually illustrated that the primary circulating strains in the Los Angeles area specifically have been associated with the African lineage, which is uh, part of the CLAD 3 designation. You might ask, what is the importance of knowing the geographical um, lineage of these Canada auras, um, why is that important? Knowing what clad your Canada auras isolates within your patient population is helpful, especially for susceptibility prediction modeling. For instance, strains belonging to South Asian and African lineage have higher fluconazole MICs when compared to other lineages. Since the first outbreak of Canada RS was identified in LA County in July of 2020, the number of cases has increased to over a thousand cumulative cases, with the organism now being considered endemic to most skilled nursing facilities or long-term care hospitals within the county, as shown in the table on the right. The table summarizes case counts by case and hospital care facility type. Approximately 9% of all LA County cases had a bloodstream infection that was found to be attributed to Canada RS. The rest of the cases were noted to be colonized on the skin 
and or in non-sterile sites. The graph on the left on this slide illustrates the screening program conducted by LA County Public Health between June of 2020 to December of 2021, where it shows the screening of over 11,000 Canada RS cases from different hospital facilities, in which they found that approximately 8% of those cases came from colonized individuals and were identified before admission to a clinical setting. This really highlights the need for active surveillance and appropriate infection prevention strategies at the hospital level. This prompted our laboratory to develop a two-tier clinical surveillance diagnostic algorithm for the enhanced detection and further prevention of transmission of Canada RS within our hospital setting. The first step in this clinical diagnostic algorithm is for the active surveillance by RT-PCR. The second step is strain typing by the IR biotyper. Both of these steps in this two-tier diagnostic algorithm assesses the status of patients being admitted into our hospital for those individuals identified to be at high risk for Canada RS, which includes but are not limited to anyone transferred from a skilled nursing facility or a long-term care hospital that seems to be chronically ventilated with a tracheostomy. The surveillance PCR utilizes the BioGX Canada RS RT-PCR reagents for use with the BDMAX open testing system. It utilizes the ITS-2 primer probe set as set forth in the publication of Leach et al. In 20, published in 2018. If positive, the patient remains in contact isolation. If negative, the patient is removed from contact isolation. Any positive Canada RS surveillance PCR specimen gets reflexed to fungal culture when it gets plated on inhibitory mold agar and chrome Canada Plus RS plates. Once isolated, identification is confirmed by Malditoff. The isolate then gets full antimicrobial susceptibility testing utilizing the yeast one assay microdilution platform. And in parallel, the isolate goes through the second step of our diagnostic algorithm, which is strain typing by the IR biotyper. But before I get into the second tier of our diagnostic Canada RS algorithm, the surveillance PCR was found to be highly specific and sensitive. Daily PCR testing runs were performed from an axilla groin specimen collected from patients admitted with risk factors. Risk factors included admission from skilled nursing facility, long-term care hospital, and high-risk patients that are chronically ventilated or with a tracheostomy. Since the rollout of our Surveillance Canada RS PCR, we have successfully screened over 2,400 and more high-risk patients and have found a positivity rate of colonization of around 4% which has been found to play a critical role in infection prevention and transmission of this elusive pathogen. In addition to rapid identification of colonized patients, an alternative to strain typing method was needed to aid in real-time outbreak investigations within our clinical setting. In this context, the laboratory turned to spectroscopy-based techniques, particularly setting focus on the IR biotyper. The IR biotyper utilizes mid-infrared radiation associated with Fourier-transformed IR spectroscopy. This direct IR radiation, infrared radiation, generates vibration patterns primarily in the CO stretching of biomolecules such as carbohydrates within the biochemical structure of these prokaryotic cells. These vibration patterns generate strain-specific absorbance fingerprints within the infrared spectrum, which can be used to differentiate among isolates. Literature has shown extensive reports illustrating the discriminatory power among gram-positive, gram-negative pathogens that are associated with nosocomial outbreaks within the hospital setting in regards to the IR typer, biotyper, but there is little to no reports 
with respect to fungal strain typing. So our laboratory wanted to see if we could apply this infrared spectroscopy technology for its utilization of fungal strain typing, particularly with Canada RS isolates from identified PCR positive specimens. Any isolated Canada RS strain from an identified positive PCR specimen would get plated on Sabdex agar and incubated at 35 degrees Celsius for 24 hours to prepare the isolate for fungal typing. Protocol was followed as stated by the manufacturer with minor optimizations to fit our laboratory needs. To perform spectra acquisitions, a specimen was plated at a minimum of five replicates on the silicone sample plate. Spectra was recorded using the IR Biotyper spectrometer. The recorded spectra was then visualized and processed by the Opus version 8.2 software. To expand on the differences between the spectra of different isolates, the second derivative of each of the isolates were performed using client software version 3.0. Standardization of media type, temperature, and incubation time allows for interpretation and processing of specimens at different time points. Following specimen preparation, the average time from processing to result is approximately three hours. On this slide, you can see some of our preliminary data. A disclaimer to this is that we used whole genome sequencing um, to assess the validity of the spectral data analysis and not as a strict comparator method. So all of the data and conclusions that we derived from the IR biotyper analysis were supported by whole genome sequencing. So the questions we wanted to ask here was, we first wanted to test the discriminatory power of the IR biotyper among different clinically relevant yeast species, including Canada albicans, Canada glabrata, Canada auris, and Cryptococcus neoformans. Hierarchical cluster analysis allowed for the su successful differentiation of different yeast isolates, which form distinct clusters both at the genus and species level, as shown here on the slide. One of the many advantages of client software version 3.0 on the IR Biotyper is that you can analyze and view your data in many different ways. On this slide, we have a principal component analysis of the normalized second derivative of each of the spectra for each of the isolates. Here, the principal component analysis plot is illustrating the successful differentiation of the different clinically significant yeast isolates, which again are found to be aggregating or clustering based on the differences at both the genus and species level. This is another example of the advantages of the client software version 3.0. It is a very versatile platform that allows the user to visualize and analyze the data using different techniques. Here is the same 2D principal component analysis plot that was shown in the previous slide, but now I'm illustrating the data in a three-dimensional space, which again is showing the clustering of these clinically significant fungal isolates based on both the genus and species level. Now that we were successfully able to differentiate among these different fungal species, we wanted to really look at, at a closer look and assess the variability and similarities among the identified Canada RS isolates, which I will go into the next slide. So we took a subset of the isolated Canada RS isolates and process them according to our protocol as discussed earlier in the presentation. Spectra acquisition was acquired by the IR Biotyper spectrometer and its normalized second derivative was analyzed using client software version 3.0. This data was then referenced to whole genome single nucleotide polymorphism based phylogenetic analysis 
of the Canada RS sequence genomes. This analysis showed the assignment of the two of two subset of Canada RS into two distinct lineages. The majority of Canada RS isolates were closely related to African lineage or CLAD3, apart from a single Canada RS isolate that was found to be genetically distinct. The single isolate replicate cluster was closely related to a Canada RS isolate from the South Asian lineage that belonged to the CLAD1. IR-based spectrum typing analysis of the Canada RS isolates confirmed the separation of the two specified clusters. Cluster 3, as shown on the slide, demonstrates isolates belonging to the African lineage, and Cluster 4, the single isolate cluster belonging to the South Asian clad. Furthermore, phylogenetic Kamer analysis of Canada RS isolates in Cluster 3 to its closest ancestral relative showed less than 30 SNP difference among the strains, which contain isolates from both the main hospital and its affiliated clinical center. IR spectra typing analysis distance matrix supported the whole genome reference data in that the majority of circulating Canada R strains are genetically very similar, suggesting that population genetics are geospatial specific in origin with subsequent spread making transmission within a hospital setting very hard to definitively conclude without any additional epidemiological data supporting that conclusion. Clusters were defined by either admission from a specific skilled nursing facility or from a specific long-term care hospital that the patient had transferred from or had been residing for a long period of time before being admitted into our hospital setting. This slide is showing you another way of visualizing your data within the client software version 3.0 on the IR Biotyper. I'm a visual person, so this actually helps me picture and clearly see the separation between the two lineages that we observed from the subset of Canada RS isolates that was shown in the previous slide. This is clearly showing a distribution of a single cluster belonging to the South Asian lineage and then the majority of the isolates clustering together um, which are all belonging to that predominant LA strain that is currently circulating that um, derives from the African lineage. The next steps that we are currently moving towards is can we take this classifiers, this data regarding CLAD distribution within our patient population and utilize the AI, artificial intelligence uh, feature in the new software and see if we can come up with predictive modeling where we can keep track of these CLAD distributions within our patient population and then in turn see if there's any trends or shift in the lineages and how that affects the susceptibility pattern within the Canada RS isolates of our patient population that are currently circulating the Los Angeles area in real time. Overall, the two-tier Canada RS surveillance diagnostic algorithm composed of a rapid surveillance real-time PCR for rapid detection of the organism, complemented by fungal strain typing platform for clonal prediction modeling has been proven successful. Primarily, we were able to show that the IR biotyper was able to allow for the successful discrimination of various yeast isolates, which included Canada albicans, Canada glabrata, Canada RS, and Cryptococcus neoformans. Furthermore, the IR spectrum typing method distributed the process Canada RS isolates into two distinct lineages as supported by phylogenetic genomic analysis of whole genome sequencing. Overall, the two key findings that we were able to collectively conclude is that isolates are not clustering based on the hospital in which they are admitted to but clustering based on which skilled nursing facility or long-term care hospital they are transferring from. Given that these isolates are very genetically similar to one another, it just further supports that and there is currently one huge Canada RS outbreak that is plaguing our Los Angeles County area moving from one long-term care hospital or skilled nursing facility to another. 
The second point we were able to conclude based on this data is that the IR biotyper has strong discriminatory power based on the classifier of genomic clad distribution. We were able to identify two primary lineages that are found in our patient population. And from these classifiers, we can utilize the artificial intelligent software in the client software version 3.0 to develop a predictive model for unknown ongoing Canada RS isolates that we isolate in the future from our patient population. So now that you've heard all about our fungal strain typing application utilizing the IR biotyper, I'm going to shift gears and present briefly um, about our second application of the IR biotyper in microbial strain typing, specifically when it comes to uh, salmonella species. Second application of the IR biotyper was used in an outbreak investigation of two stem cell cultures growing salmonella species. This was cause for alarm, as you all probably might feel right now, because these were the very first salmonella positive stem cell cultures in our institution, in which we alerted um, the apheresis and the epidemiological department, which of course prompted a very quick outbreak investigation. Briefly, two patients about two months apart had a stem cell collection in which cultures from both uh, collection days were positive for Salmonella Group D. The first patient, briefly, this was a 65-year-old woman with history of multiple myeloma. Her stem cell collection was uh, initially back in January of 2022 and um, she actually presents with no clinical illness, but has a remote history of salmonella bacteremia back in 2019. The second patient, which is case two, this was a 45 year old woman with history of aplastic anemia. Her peripheral stem cell collection was on March of 2022. She actually had no clinical illness and no known history of salmonella infection. Given the high suspicion of contamination at either the collection or laboratory sites, epidemio epidemiology looked at some additional data such as, did multiple people handle the specimens? Actually, no. Samples were transported by a dedicated lab employee to the laboratory from the Ephoresis site. Um, and samples were processed at separate times by the dedicated technician according to standard of practice under a class two biological safety cabinet utilizing sterile technique. So all of these additional epidemiological data um, was pointing to a no common source of contact between these two cultures. Furthermore, the laboratory aided in the investigation by performing strain typing of the isolated salmonella isolates from these two patient cases. Fourier transform infrared spectroscopy was utilized to differentiate the salmonella strains from the two patients in question when compared to other salmonella strains isolated in the laboratory from prior years. Disclaimer, whole genome typing data was used to assess the validity of the spectra analysis acquired by the IR biotyper in this um, study as well. Based on cluster analysis of the Salmonella species uh, included in the study, the IR biotyper effectively separated the different serovars based on their respective O antigen groups, such as group D, group C1, and group B. Internal validation and cluster analysis of the data determined the two isolates from case one, patient 1A and 1B isolates were identical, but different from the isolate that grew out of the stem cell cultures from patient two or case two. The no distance within the cluster further demonstrated them to be genomically related, but not identical, which is very important to determine if this was the same strain during this investigation. So on this slide, I'm just showing again the versatility of client software version 3.0, um, just representing the data from the previous slide in a principal component analysis plot that is illustrating the findings 
that the salmonella isolates were found to be geno uh, genomically very related, but not the same isolate. This is a distance matrix, which might sometimes convey more information than the den uh, dendogram. But in this case, I just wanted to include this in the presentation because I wanted to illustrate that there wasn't much difference between the salmonella isolates due to them being genomically similar uh, in the case that they belong to the same serial group and the same subtype, but not the same identical strain. This also prompts us to uh, look at other parameters, other data, such as the susceptibility profile and the morphological appearance, etc., that distinguishes these two isolates that were recovered at two different time points. This was further supported by looking at other factors. Um, on this slide, we looked at the susceptibility profile of these two isolates that were recovered from both of these two stem cell cultures. And as you can see, um, these two different isolates had a very different um, susceptibility profile, which further supported the um, notion that even though these were genomically related, they were not the same strain or isolate. Along with looking at their susceptibility profile, we also looked at the culture morphology of each of the isolates. And data is not shown. I'm not showing you the pictures of the two plates here, but I can assure you that they both have two different morphologies, further again supporting the notion that these two were genomically related, but not the same strain. Overall, taking all of the data together, uh, both the epidemiological data, the susceptibility, the morphological data that I, I didn't show here, but also the strain typing results that we were able to acquire from the IR biotyper, the team was able to dismiss the possibility of an outbreak and deem that these two cases of salmonella positive stem cell cultures arose from two independent occurrences and not from a common source, dismissing the idea of an outbreak situation. Overall, in our laboratory, the IR biotyper has proven to be a great alternative method for strain typing uh, that is moderately priced, technically friendly with post-analysis ease that um, is easy to use and learn, um, and has proven to be an effective alternative to whole genome sequencing. With this, I conclude my talk and I will be taking any questions at this point. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Contreras, for your informative presentation. We will now start our live Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have a question you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for. Let's get started. Our first question is, has your lab incorporated the IR biotyper as a diagnostic test alongside the Candida RS-PCR or is it used as a research only, use only? Uh, that's a good question. So right now we are currently fully validating. So all of the data that was presented was preliminary data. Since it's not uh, promoted as a diagnostic tool, uh, we use this as a, a research use only supplement to help, um, to help us do some trend analysis with Canada R's isolates that are isolated from our laboratory. Therefore, creating a predictive model no and kind of doing real-time strain that typing okay. in terms of actually um, doing real-time analysis as, you know, we, we continue to isolate from PCR-positive uh, specimens. So right now, it's research used only and if, uh, or by request only, either by epidemiology or infection control. Great, thank you. Our next question is, how are you going to identify lineages of unknown Candida RS strains isolated from your patient's population in real time? So as I previously alluded in the beginning of the presentation, we're doing this for several different projects. So the new um, science software that's included in the IR Biotyper um, has a machine learning parameter. So we're developing predictive model, um, which we are applying artificial intelligence and machine learning 
The machine learning uses specific software algorithms, specifically artificial neural network and support vector machine uh, testing algorithms to make predictions based on known classifiers. So for each of these separate studies, we're continuing to um, have three different sets of, of, of isolates or resource material that we're using. For the Canada RS, um, we have a train set, a test set, and a validation set. So based on this train set of isolates that we have, um, we have full uh, characterized isolates based on the lineage they belong to, the skilled nursing facility or long-term care facility that, that, that they have transferred uh, from. Based on these classifiers, we are training, uh, we are using these algorithms so they can make predictive uh, predictive notions or pre predictions based on that. Uh, currently, we have done the learning step. Now we have moved on to actually testing some of our isolates, which are also well characterized, and then we will plug in some unknowns. Uh, for the salmonella, a similar situation was used in terms of, of machine learning uh, parameters as well. So we used different serial group classifiers as well as different serotypes classifiers. So well-characterized isolates that were used to quote unquote, help the algorithm learn these classifiers based on these strains. And then we would test the learning of the instrument, and then um, and then we uh, we make predict predictions based on that. Awesome, thank you. Our next question is: Would it be possible to comment on the regrants used for the IR biotyper technique? Is it possible to perform the technique from broth culture? Must it be from grown colonies on agar? The IR biotyper does identify the species or should we inform the species on the software? Thank you for that question. So yes, um, so let me, I'll just answer them according to the order it was uh, asked. So the reagents that were used are reagents that can be found in your laboratory that you already have, right? So we actually buy a kit from Brooker itself where they provide two external controls that are used um, in, on every run. Um, those in, external controls kind of calibrate the instrument for uh, data acquisition. The isolates, before deciding on what media, uh, what standardized media we used, we tested a variety of uh, media, including you know, your, your SABDEX, your uh, IMA, um, and then you're also your chromogenic agars, right? To kind of just uh, isolate them, isolate the Canada Rs from these PCR positive specimens. Once the isolate is uh, confirmed to be Canada Rs, we found that SAPDEX, uh, all purpose media, uh, non selective media, actually gives us the best uh, replication results. So we stuck to the SAPDEX media as our optimized choice of media. We incubate uh, overnight. We standardize the time of incubation and the temperature of incubation at 24 hours at 35 degrees. Uh, and after that, we do isolate uh, enough biomass from the actual confluent uh, pure culture plate. The biomass has to be enough um, it's similar to your MALDI biotype, right? If there's not enough biomass, then you run into problems with your, your data analysis as well. So we've only tried it from solid media. We have not tried it from uh, broth, but the manufacturer does have a broth option if that's what you would like to take. Uh, we decided that was not part of our, our workflow that we wanted to incorporate in our laboratory. So we've only optimized growth from solid media. Um, for this strain typing analysis, the IR biotyper, you need to have um, you need to have known well characterized organisms, right? So you need to have the identification uh, that they are Canada Rs. Uh, we did supplement our 
data with whole genome sequencing to, to make conclusions based on what we were seeing with the IR biotyper. So we are solely using it for strain typing purposes to make lineage trend predictions in the future. Um, and then if we incorporate other classifiers, this predictive model based on the machine learning uh, ability of the software, these known well-characterized classifiers can then give you insight of unknown strains. So basically, you, for the initial validation of your instrument, you do have to have well-classified isolates uh, in order to develop this predictive model in the future. All right, our next question is, besides the applications presented here, has your lab explored any other venues? Yes, so we are currently using it for Canada RS and Salmonella uh, building and developing a predictive model, but we are also using it for, um, we're expanding it to see if we can utilize the IR biotyper in typing mycobacteriology, obviously non-tuberculosis strains. Specific focus is utilizing the IR biotyper for mycobacterium abscesses and seeing if we can create a predictive model based on clarithromycin uh, susceptibility. So is the IR biotyper able to discriminate between um, subspecies of M abscesses? And based on that, can we make a predictive model to predict clarithromycin or to aid in the prediction of clarithromycin susceptibility testing? Perfect. Our next question is, can the identification be performed only with Malditoff MS? So identification can be performed. So yes, one of the main, the main uh, identification systems that we use in our laboratory is Malditoff. And I'm, I'm sure that's a similar situation across uh, many laboratories, right? Uh, but um, you can identify your isolates any way that your laboratory uses, any workflow, uh, any identification system can be used to identify before jumping into the uh, strain typing portion, uh, utilizing the IR biotyper. Awesome, and it looks like we have one more question here. Um, what comparator method was used to validate the IR biotyper? Perfect, um, so the comparator method since this is a different technology, right? It's infrared spectroscopy. Um, so the, the comparator, it wasn't a strict comparator method, but we did utilize whole genome sequencing, specifically KMER SNP analysis was conducted on each of the isolates that we were able to um, confirm from our PCR positive uh, specimens. Uh, to validate the conclusions that we were seeing uh, from our spectra that were generated by the IR typer. The whole genome sequencing was not used as a straight, uh, strict method competitor, but it was used to validate the conclusions. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Contreras. Do you have any final comments for our audience? Um, no, I think, um, you know, given the resources and the funding and, um, you know, our laboratory is always trying to find and utilize new platforms to answer or fill in gaps, diagnostic gaps, uh, to help aid in patient clinical management. Um, I think the IR biotyper is a great alternative. It's very cost effective. Um, Brooker has done a fantastic job at providing support in terms of data analysis, learning the, the software. Uh, they've been very, very helpful in that situation. Uh, they make it easy for us to ask questions and keep an open door of communication and support. I think this is a great alternative. The turnaround time um, compared to whole genome sequencing is actually faster, right? Initially, yes, you have to optimize your platform like any other new assay. But once you get an optimization and you feel comfortable with the software and you, you validate your data conclusions um, using an alternative method, this can definitely be a faster, uh, faster alternative, cost-effective, 
uh, user-friendly, tech-friendly uh, method to incorporate real-time strain typing within your clinical laboratory. Great, thank you so much. Um, it appears we have a few more questions that popped in and we do have time to get to these. Um, so another question that was asked is, at this time, it appears that you are using whole genome to confirm the results that are obtained from the IR biotyper. What is the benefit of running the IR biotyper? Moving forward, will there be a time when whole genome testing will not be required? And how will you determine that just IR biotyper testing is a sufficient method? That's a very good question. Um, so let me answer the first uh, portion of the question is that, yes, we did use whole genome sequencing to validate our conclusions that were made from the IR biotyper. The benefit to using the IR biotyper is, again, um, the user-friendly uh, ability to, uh, to perform the strain typing, right? From, from the pre-analytical to the analytical and to the post-analytical assessment of your data. So all of those components um, from start to finish uh, takes approximately three hours. If you were doing whole genome sequencing, just alone generating libraries and the sequencing portion can take up to three days, right? Also the technical, I guess, bottleneck that a lot of clinical laboratories have, right? So a lot of clinical laboratories don't have this technical ability to perform whole genome sequencing. Uh, your biotyper is great because everybody can pipette. Everybody can collect, uh, grow the isolates. Uh, everybody has the essential reagents that are needed. There's no extra cost. The only cost is that you do have to, you know, there is a kit that Broker um, provides that is utilized within the whole processing uh, uh, steps. So the is ability, the cost effectiveness, um, how it's, uh, you know, the our CLSs, um, confidence level and actually performing the method, all of that and the support, the technical support that you get from Broker makes it a great alternative. Moving forward, so we are trying to collect enough uh, diversity within our isolates, especially with Canada Aris and our Salmonella, as well as other projects. So we're trying to build our diversity library where we can fully internally validate our machine learning predictive model, where it does cover all of the lineages, all of the classifiers included in that model that we feel confident enough where we can say that, yes, our validated specimens that are coming in are the actual, uh, is what we actually, is, is correct, right? Is, is There's a high accuracy. Right now, we're still in the validation portion of it because we are trying to collect uh, a wide diversity of uh, isolates that can cover all aspects of our classifiers. So once we collect um, a significant number where we feel comfortable, then we are able to you know, decrease or not utilize whole genome sequencing at that point. Great. And another question we have is, do you have plans to use MRSA uh, stain analysis? So there is um, plans to move forward to that. Not at this point. Uh, it is in the works. Um, we only have so many hands uh, that are av available to work with in our clinical laboratory. So as soon as we find, um, you know, time uh, where we can invest in that, but that is in the works. That's part of the, the alternative applications that we have ongoing here in the laboratory. Great, thank you so much. I'll give it just a second here to make sure no more questions pop in. All right, thank you so much again, Dr. Contreras, for your time today and your important research. We would also like to thank LabRoots and our sponsor, Bruker, for underwriting today's educational webcast. Before we go, I'd like to thank the audience for joining us and for their interesting questions. Questions we did not have time for today and those submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by the speaker via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. 
This webcast can be viewed on demand. Labyrinths will alert you via email when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Until next time, goodbye.